So when I talk about strategic ideas, when I do, uh, the main idea is <clears throat> not necessarily to talk about tactics. So there shouldn't be any, you know, white to play and win a piece or made in three. However, you need to understand tactics so your ideas work. So you may have a piece somewhere and you want to move it somewhere else. It might take two or three moves. But while you're doing that, you're blundering like every other piece on the board because you're not paying attention to that. And that's why Karpov is so good. And Karpov's been to our club before. And he was the world chess champion for 10 years. And you've all heard of him, right? Yay, Karpov. And they're like, nah, Karpov, terrible. Uh, and Karpov was well known for having great strategic ideas, taking positions that looked equal or boring, and slowly improving and, and getting a winning position. Now, we'll do a little history of chess to understand what strategic ideas are. In the 1800s, you had famous players like Paul Morphy, yay. And in those days, you know, you sacrificed all your pieces and you played for mate. And not only did you sacrifice all your pieces, your opponent was supposed to take them. Like, if you didn't take somebody's piece sacrifice, what's wrong with you? Okay, you gotta take that. And either they mated you or they didn't and you were up four pieces. That's how chess was played in the 1800s. Then, there was a guy named Wilhelm Steinitz, who you've also all heard of. You're supposed to, okay. And uh, Steinitz was the first official world champion and Steinitz also played like a lunatic. And some of his greatest games are really interesting. And then, at some point, he said, wait a minute, I could get a space advantage and control the center and castle and have a safer king and have better development and eventually I'll win because I have a lot of little advantages. And when I talk about strategy and strategic ideas, I talk about little advantages. Like, you control a square, your bishop is better, your knight is better, you have a better center, you have less isolated pawns, your king is safer. And Steinitz would say, if you have a lot of little advantages, then you win, because you have a, a winning position. And after Steinitz, that's basically the way chess has been at the top level. If you watch a game and some guy wins a pawn or wins two pawns and there's no compensation, they just win. The game is just over. Now, at the Junior Championship, some of the games are very suspicious, so somebody can win material and still lose, because these aren't the best players in the world. Now, the game I want to show you today is Karpov Komsky from 1992, and it's one of my favorite games, because Karpov does something that's very rare. He gets a big advantage on one side of the board, and you're all thinking, you know, win, win, win. And Karpov doesn't do that. He says, okay, I'm winning over here. Now we're going to play over here. And then he wins over there, and then he plays over there. And he's winning everywhere, and his opponent can't move. And so this is, why, this is one of my favorite games, because he slowly improves this position. And the other reason I like the game is the person that he's playing, that's what he does also. So it's very impressive to beat somebody at their own game. And I'm sure all of you have heard of Gadakomsky. Some, no, nobody's heard of Gadakomsky? Yeah, he's U.S. champion every year. That helps. In this club? No? Just reigning champion, just one? Yeah, there you go. And also, he played a world championship match with Anatoly Karpov. Who won that match? Karpov, because Komsky's never been world champion. Now, that was a weird match. That was when Kasparov and Fide were arguing and stuff. So we, that match didn't really count. Kasparov was world champion. Okay, so this game started, let's see if these buttons work. Okay, D4, okay. And we have a King's Indian or Grunfeld. Karpov played G3, which is very rare for him. Normally Karpov is playing classical Sicilian uh, with knight C3 and E4. And, well, Komsky did something he also doesn't do very often. One of the things I noticed about the top players is they play everything. They're good at every opening and they study all of them. And then if they get tricked into one or the other, they still have some, some stuff going on. And he played C6, which is not what Komsky normally does in this position. Normally, Komsky would play a Grunfeld by something like castles 
bishop, not bishop h3, terrible. Wait, why is it going to h3? Oh, I'd have to do this, okay. And then, then maybe d5 or d6. Okay, d5. And this is a common Grunfeld position that I would expect Komsky to have. And if you play at our chess club on a regular basis, you may know one of our club members, Matthew Larson, very tall, very skinny, and he's rated about 2030, 2040, and he likes to play this position with, with the black pieces, the Grunfeld. Now, instead, Gata played c6, and because he played c6, he's preparing to play d5, and that's something that we should probably talk about for an hour, because I get paid by the hour, right? Oh, learn that when you're an adult, that's important. Okay, or watch Arrested Development and learn how they charge by the hour. The, the lawyer is pretty funny, actually. <clears throat> so one of the things I do that you guys never do, not that I'm insulting all of you, but what's, I do it all the time and you guys rarely do it, is I make preparatory moves. I want to make a move, but I can't make it. So instead of giving up or making it anyway and losing, I prepare to make it. So you go to the store and you buy chicken, right, Ben? Okay, I don't because I'm a vegetarian. But, and you buy chicken, it's frozen. You take it home and then you start eating it? Or do you do something first? Like something. something, okay, and that's called preparing. You have to prepare the chicken so you can eat it. Otherwise, you won't live very long, okay? And so, Komsky wants to play d5, but he wants to take back with a pawn, which is what happens. And a lot of openings in chess, like the Karakhan, the French defense, those are all your favorite openings, right? You've heard of them, right? Okay, those are preparatory moves on move one. You're gonna play d5 on move two, but you're preparing it. So c6, black wants to play d5, but he wants to protect it by a pawn. And that's what happened. Okay, and Karpov takes. Because Karpov likes really simple positions with a simple plan. And Karpov is worried if he doesn't take He'll have to learn some complicated variation where black takes on c4 and he sacrifices a pawn for a couple of moves. Karpov thinks if I have a symmetrical position and it's my turn to move, I have the advantage. Makes sense? So he gets a symmetrical position. And again, a lot of my students would probably raise their hand and say, well, I want to capture with the queen or the knight on d5. You could capture with the queen or the knight but then you're gonna start moving the same piece many times. For example, if you capture with a queen, no, not there, okay. Uh, which one of these do I want? New variation. Then when your queen's attacked, you're gonna start moving your queen again, and you're getting rid of the control of the center. White's gonna have pawns in the center, and you're not. Also, you didn't play c6, so you could not take back with the c pawn. That's why you played c6. You want this pawn in the center. Okay, that's what you want. Not off the board, you want it in the center. And of course, this position's symmetrical, so it's pretty close to equal. Knight c3, castles, knight e5. White is avoiding castling so he can do stuff in the center first. Like he's putting pressure on the d-pawn by moving his knight out of the way, and he's making it hard for black to develop his pieces. Uh, it's not clear actually how black should develop. For example, if black plays knight c6, which he did not play, looks like a normal sort of move, he might be worried that this pawn's gonna be weak and that white's gonna attack it by putting his rook on the open file, using his queen, or making sure the pawn can never move by putting his knight in front of it. And now, black has this isolated pawn and this is called, what kind of pawn is this called? We have a name for that. Backward pawn. Backward pawn, right, or C pawn. Okay, so that ruins black's pawn structure a little bit. Okay, so Konsky has a really good idea. Instead of trading this knight for this knight, he's gonna trade this knight. Then his bishop will be wide open. But he can't move this knight because then his D pawn is hanging. This pawn needs protection. Okay, and this is the strategic idea. How do we protect our pawn so we can move our knight away and get rid of that invading knight? How do we protect this pawn? 
Move the king pawn up, e6. Same answer, right? And he played e6. Now, every move in chess is good and bad. Okay, sort of like you. You're a good person. But, you know, I know Ben pretty well. So, you know, bad too. You gotta watch it, right? Stole my name. I had it first. Okay. Now, it's good because we're protecting the center. The center's good. It's bad because it makes our bishop not so happy. Bishop's not happy. So we'll have to fix that later. Castles, knight f d7. Now his bishop is open, and he's kicking out the invading knight. Now Karpov doesn't want to get kicked out, and he doesn't want to trade that beautiful knight for the knight that's way back there. So how does he protect his knight? Protect our knight. Bring up the other uh, f pawn. Oops, terrible. Correct. f4. Now white has more space. White has this beautiful knight here. And if black trades the knights and white gets a pawn there, then white's going to have control of this square, d6. So maybe his knight's going to come in. So black doesn't want to do that. He plays knight c6. Now, he's not so worried that white's going to take this knight like he was the last time because his knight is already protecting c5. He's going to play c5 really quickly. So he's not as scared. Karpov played bishop e3, getting his last minor piece out and defending his pawn on, on e3, on d4. Now, you were taught by somebody, or you weren't, should have been, that you shouldn't put pieces in front of your center pawns. Okay, You have two center pawns, you put a bishop or a knight in front of them, they can't move. So what's Karpov doing? What's wrong with him? Well, Karpov put his bishop there temporarily. Okay, he doesn't like this square for his bishop. That hangs the d-pawn. He doesn't like this square for his bishop. He can't jump over his pawn. So he's doing what's called a maneuver. Normally in chess, you maneuver your knights. Your knight's here, and you want it somewhere else. In chess, you can also maneuver your bishops. A little more rare, because bishops usually can go in one turn. This bishop's going to go back, either here or here. And then the e-pawn's going to move forward and we have our d-pawn defended by the bishop. So that's actually a good defensive piece. Knight b6. Komsky likes this c4 square. Bishop f2, as I espoused. And bishop d7. So unlike most of you, these guys develop their pieces in castle. I wish I could say about the juniors. I watch the junior games, and like, I don't know, it's move 20, and the pieces are still on the back row. I don't know how they do that. You watch Super Grandmasters play, all their bishops are out, all their knights are out, and they've castled. And Komsky wants to put his rook on the open line. And Komsky says, well, my bishop's not so good here. It's blocked by my pawns. So if you take that bishop, that means you wasted all your moves with your knight. Knight here, knight here, knight takes bishop, and now black doesn't have that bad bishop. So Karpov plays e4, playing in the center, looks good. And ooh, white's going to win a pawn next move. So there's two things black can do. He can take the pawn, obviously, or he can defend his pawn. The problem with taking the pawn is this knight's really good on e4. It's going to d6. It's going to c5. And white's moving forward with his pieces. And, well, maybe I would have done that, because I'm not as good as Komsky. But Komsky defended his center pawn. He wants to keep his pawn in the center. How did he do that? Also, I'm doing this from memory from 20 years ago. I hope he made the move I said he made. 97. Who knows? Right. 90, that's my recollection he played 97. I don't know. I looked at this game in 1993. So it's been 20 years. <laughs> OK. Uh, 97 was played. Hooray. And now we got a good defense here of the center pawn, and our bishop has a lot more squares. Now, Karpov did something, if I remember correctly, that I would usually advise against, but he had a good reason. Most super grandmasters, they like bishops better than knights. And generally, the lower rated you are, the more you like knights, because you're forking your opponent's pieces with the knights, and they're like, ah. Then when you're a super grandmaster, your opponents don't fall for that anymore. Now you like bishops more, because bishops can move really fast. My bishop's over here, I can go this side of the board in one move. If I have a knight, 
I'm hopping around slow. I can't get there. So grandmasters like bishops. Grandmasters also like space. Now, lower rated players like yourselves, you like to take free pieces. You're like, I'm a piece up. I'm two pieces up. I'm three pieces up. You know you're winning, right? These guys don't do that. They don't give their pieces away. So you have to get other advantages. That's why it's an ideas class. And an idea that good players like, like Yasser Sarawan, who's the grandmaster in residence, who does the commentary with me, he loves space. Space is his favorite. He has space, so he can move his pieces, and you have no space. Okay? So if I'm standing in the middle of the room, I can go wherever I want. But if I'm standing over here, then I'm trapped, and I don't have anywhere to go. Same thing in chess. If you move forward, you have all that space to move your pieces, and your opponent gets more and more cramped. So Karpov, he did a two for one. He got two bishops, and he got more space. So you guys like to be two pieces up. He likes two bishops and more space. He likes different things than you do. And he played knight takes d7. And what was his follow-up? e5. So he says, I have more space than you, and I have more bishops than you. This bishop here is particularly suspicious. OK, Komsky plays rook to c8, putting the rook on the open line. Seems sort of normal. Rook to c1, challenging the open line. Again, normal. And then Komsky plays a6. Komsky is stopping this knight from ever going to d6. And he's preparing to play b5 and b4 later, attacking on the queen side. b3. And again, when you see this pawn and this pawn and this pawn, you might be thinking, king side attack. And you are correct. When you have a space advantage, you want to eventually go forward. But Karpov, he doesn't just like to beat you and do what he wants to do. He wants to stop you from doing what you want to do. And he says, well, this knight on b6, someday it's going to move forward. And Karpov is like, that could, be, that could harass me a little bit. So I'm going to play b3. And now the knight on b6 looks pretty stupid. It can't go to a4, can't go to c4. Can't, where can it go? It can go to a8. Now, eh, maybe he'll go there later. So Karpov is like, look, you're not doing anything. And once you don't do anything, then I'll beat you. So Karpov. This, this is the one thing I learned when I worked with Gregory Kaidanov, 1993, 1994, when I had the Sanford Fellowship and I got to work with somebody. He said, don't always think about what you want to do. Think about stopping your opponent from what they want to do. This is a big issue with the junior players. Yes, Sir Sarawan's always sitting here saying, this is the long-term plan for white, and then the kid sacrifices all his pieces because he wants to give mate right away. And he wants to calculate some long variation. And sometimes they're right, and sometimes they're wrong. And the answer is like, why doesn't he just slowly build his position his opponent can't move? And the juniors don't want to do that. But you should want to do that. You should want to stop your opponent. But OK, Komsky is pretty good. Rook c7, what's his next move? Double off. He's going to play here and take advantage of the knight on c3. Queen d2, protecting the knight. And rook c8, obviously. So this is a great uh, game for this, for this lecture, for this class, because now we get to see why Karpov was such a good player. Because what he does is, he does what he wants to do, which is to advance on the king side where he has more space. At the same time, he stops his opponent from what they want to do. He plays g4, which is anybody who wants to checkmate black, they would play g4. Bishop to f8. Why did black play bishop to f8? Was his bishop good on g7? Not really. Where can that bishop on f8 go on that other diagonal? What's a good square? This bishop. a3, right? And b4. Lots of good squares. All kinds of good squares. So Komsky's like, man, I want my bishop to go here. And Komsky has a good idea. He saw that this knight was weakened by b3. When this pawn was on b2, I was, I was solid. So when white puts his pawns on white squares, that means they're not defending the dark squares. White's pawns are on dark squares in the middle. So this bishop on g7 really isn't doing anything here. So Komsky plays bishop f8. 
Karpov plays queen e3. He doesn't want bishop b4 to pin his knight. Even if it's illegal, he doesn't want it to happen. And this is why the world champion Tigran Petrosyan, or for you Americans, Petrosian, this is why he was so good. He knew what you wanted to do before you knew you wanted to do it. So he knows Komsky is going to get his bishop over here, so he's getting his queen out of the way. And knight c6, obviously this bishop is going to start harassing. f5, hooray, attack. Bishop to a3, as advertised, attacking the rook on, on c1. Rook to d1. Well, rook c2 might look normal, but then what do you do after knight b4? Uh-oh. And again, one of the things that's important, strategy is important, playing the right ideas is important, but you have to see the tactics along with the strategy. If the guy's attacking all of your pieces and you can't save them, then your strategy didn't work. So he gets out of this pin by playing rook to d1. Komsky plays knight b4 anyway, obviously attacking the knight. Discovered attack. Queen h6. What's Karpov's next move? Pawn f6. And then white has the advantage. Now when you're playing in the chess club here, some of your opponents might play rook takes knight, f6, and then you win. That could happen, especially in a blitz game. But at the world championship level, th those guys don't make it so easy. I hate those guys. <laughs> and black played queen to e8. So if white played f6, queen f8, and now your knight on c3 is hanging, so you can't retreat your queen, you're going to lose your knight, and you don't want to trade queens, because now you're not going to mate him anymore. Now black dominates on the c-file. And this is attack when the knight moves away. So white can't do any of that. And this is the kind of thing I see lower rated players do a lot. They make a threat, f6. You stop the threat, queen f8, and they're like, all right, now what do I do? Okay, and you can't do that. You have to see what your opponent's going to do. Obviously, the knight's attacked. So Karpov played knight b1, attacking the bishop on a3. That's not good. Lose your bishop. So, bishop b2, obviously. Again, f6 doesn't work, just queen f8. And it's funny, my, my, my colleague, Gregory Kaidanov, who's just got inducted into the Hall of Fame this year, the US Hall of Fame across the street. Your favorite grandmaster. From what state? He's your favorite grandmaster. Well, I mean, what state the last 25 years? Kansas. Kansas? It does start with a K, so that's close. As far as I know, Kansas has no grandmasters. I'll be corrected by somebody from Kansas. The Kentucky. Yay. He's the Lexington Lion, or the Lion from Lexington. I don't know one of them. And Kaidanov showed me this game before anybody else did, and he was really impressed with Karpov's play. When, when Kaidanov was white, he kept analyzing sack, sacrifice, play for mate, and Karpov always surprised him. That was the first surprising move. Queen to d2. Didn't that queen look pretty impressive over here on h6? Looked like mating was coming. But Karpov, he's like, ooh, I, I like all these pieces over here. I'm going to take some of those. You don't want to lose your pieces, do you? Komsky doesn't lose pieces. Knight c2, saved all his pieces. But when you play knight c2, it's really hard to play rook c2. It's hard to do it. So now, black's counterplay is stopped. He was going to play rook c2, and he was going to infiltrate, and now he can't do that. So Karpov's happy. King h1. Why did Karpov play king h1? He wants his rook to be really active on the f file. Well, what's blocking his rook? Bishop. Well, he can move his bishop away. The problem is, if the bishop goes to a normal square, let's say h4, now nothing's protecting this pawn. Bishop takes pawn check, knight takes pawn. So 
Karpov's like, hmm, how do I move my bishop but save my pawn? This is why it's strategic ideas. Well, he wants to go to g1, but there's something on g1, so he moves it away. King, G, king h1. Now he's going to play bishop g1. His king looks pretty safe, right? And the rook on f1 is now on the open f file. And he's like, well, what's Comsi going to do? I stopped all the counterplay. Queen e7, bishop g1, as advertised. Knight to d7, getting his knight back into the game, supposedly. Rook f3, playing for mate. Queen b4. Does white want to trade queens? Nope. No, white's playing for mate. Black would love a queen trade. Then his rooks will come on the c-file. Queen h6. What's white's next move? Rook h3 looks pretty good. So black plays queen f8. Does white want to trade queens? No. Queen g5. Now, because the queen is on f8, white's threatening. F takes e6, winning immediately. Not a good square for the queen on f8. So Komsky fianchettos his queen, if I remember from 20 years ago. Yep, OK. Queen g7. And now this queen is trapped. Oh, I mean, OK, h8, but that's crazy. Queen f8 allows f takes e6 again. You can't put your queen on the file with this rook. So now Karpov goes back with his queen to d2 and says, aha, your queen's trapped, and your queen side pieces are also trapped. You can't move anything. And Karpov's going to slowly build up his attack, rook f1, h4, and so forth. Black's got to do something. He's losing on the king side, and his queen side pieces are all attacked. So Komsky's tricky. b6, defending the a5 square, because he wants to play a5 and then knight to b4. Rook f1, doubling rooks. a5, as suggested. h4. So Karpov goes about his way. I'm going to checkmate you. And now Komsky shows his idea. He sacrifices a piece because he doesn't think white can take it. Knight to b4. Can white take that bishop? Let's analyze it. What would you do with black? You move the rook on down to uh, right there. To right there, yeah. Now, white's queen is a little iffy, right? That Komsky is pretty tricky. If the queen moves somewhere, this queen's trapped. So did Karpov trap his own queen? We're going to have a commercial, and then when we come back, no, no commercial. OK. This isn't regular TV. So, so black wants to play rook to c2 and get counterplay. Sounds good, right? Counterplay is good. So he plays instead a3. He says, get your knight out of there. I don't like that knight there. Well, he doesn't want to go to c2. That's where he came from. And now his rook can't go to c2. So he played rook c2. Queen f4, moving the queen out of the way. And now the knight's attacked. Knight to c6. Now, in your professional opinion, as fine chess players, right, Mike? Sure. Who's in domination of the C file? Who's got the C file? I like black. Black. Who's got the F file? White. Right. Now, Kaidenov, when he showed me this game, and all of you, you're like, ah, I got the F file. Checkmate. And hope he doesn't get counterplay on the queen side. Karpov said, you have the C file. I want the C file. That's my file. Why do you get the C file? So Karpov won on the king's side. You can see on the king's side who's winning. White's crushing it. On the queen's side, it looks like black's winning. Black's got this, the C file dominated. Bish, and Karpov's like, you can't do that to me. I'm Karpov. Karpov says, get, your, get out of the C file. That's my file. Bishop h3, putting pressure on e6. So Komsky plays knight d8. Bishop e3, controlling the c1 square. You'll see why later. And rook f2. And Karpov says, you know what? This bishop's trapped. So I'm going to trade all the rooks off, and I'm going to go take your bishop. And this queen's not very helpful, is it? That queen's just sitting there in front of the king. So Karpov's idea is rook takes rook, then the other rook to f2, 
and we're going to win that bishop, and we're going to take the c-file. Very strange idea from somebody who's winning on the king side. I don't get it. b4, takes, 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 rook f2. What do you want black to do here? Loses rook? No. Loses bishop on b2? No. So he has to take. How does he save his bishop? Bishop a3, and now queen c2. Now who has the c-file? Right, white has the c-file. Black's bishop is trapped. White's winning on the king's side with all his pawns up there, and white's threatening to win a knight. Either queen move wins the knight. Now, when somebody's beating you strategically, and there's nothing you can do, well, if you're Komsky, there's always something you can do. Komsky is US champion several times. Komsky played for the world championship. Komsky's currently number 11 in the world. Probably better when this game was played. So he realized things weren't going well. White has more space. White has two bishops. This bishop is trapped on the side. And white's about to attack two pieces. So Komsky wasn't feeling it now. He was feeling like, I'm going to lose. But he played the trickiest moves possible. Knight takes e5. And now there's some people in this room, we won't say who they are. They're always playing tricky. They're playing tricky on move one, move two, move three. And you guys are like, ah, it's too tricky. And you give all your pieces away, and your opponent's 10 pieces up. Okay. At the top level, when you play tricky, but it doesn't work, then your opponent refutes it, and you're like, ah, oh, why did I do that? And we have examples of those players, Morozevich, Shirov, occasionally Ivanchuk playing like crazy chess, and then losing three or four games in a row. Well, Komsky played crazy because he had a losing position, and he thought crazy was his best chance. Okay, So he sacrificed a knight. But now black has all kinds of threats. Queen takes bishop, pawns hanging, this white king is exposed. So he had some idea. Okay, Karpov, he said, give me that knight, that knight on e8. Queen check, queen takes knight check, and now it's equal material, but you can't save your knight on d8. Bishop b2, check, and now, well, white's a piece up, but black might start playing bishop e5 check. That looks pretty dangerous. Then the queen and bishop could start an attack on the king. This white bishop's not really attacking black's king. That bishop's sort of trapped. So Karpov got rid of the black bishop. If you were white and you wanted this bishop to disappear off the board, what would you do? Karpov made it disappear. He's a magician. That's right. Checked him with a pawn. What did black do? One legal move, so he played it. And Preston's idea was, what does white do? Check him with a bishop. One legal move. Karpov's doing this one legal move. He can really calculate. And takes. Okay, now, if it's white's turn to move, we got some checkmate stuff going on here. G it did, but look at this checkmate. G5, bishop f3, queen f4 mate. Komsky didn't want to get checkmated. So, queen c2. Bishop f3 mate is now illegal. He's like, you can't move your bishop. Check. King g3. Why king g3 and not king h3? Because that way the pawn can protect the pawn, but then he can bring his queen back to f3 for the mate. Right, but what, what, what's the difference between h3 and g3? It protects the f3 square along with the bishop to go there. Yeah, the bishop can go there. The bishop could go there anyway because the queen's protecting it. Right. The difference, somebody said it, I don't know who. You? Yeah, yeah, if I do this, you could trade queens. Check, takes, and that's a lot of pawns to deal with. Anybody could win. Karpov doesn't want to trade queens. Karpov wants to checkmate his opponent. So king g3. Now I'm going to play mate. Mate's good because then you win. Well, what did Komsky do to stop mate? Resign. Now you play one more move if I remember right, which I may not. 
check. Yeah, then I go, here, check. Man, that's tough. Nah, he didn't let that happen. He's Komsky. Oh, he moved back to, uh, he moved down to Yeah, that's what I think. I think that's what he did. Yeah. Now, what a car pop. He trade queens with queen f4? No, ridiculous. What did he do? He moved, he moved over now to, uh, to h3, and now queen can't go to f5, can it? Now the mate is in Exactly. <laughs> yep, and Komsky gave up. Man, if you saw Komsky here at the U.S. Championship, you'd think he was the greatest player ever. But then you see him play Karpov, not quite as good. And of course, I'm not saying Karpov's a better player, because now he's not. Now, <clears throat> as many of you know, the person Anand beat in the World Championship last year was? Kapalov. Incorrect. Kapalov. Boris Galvin, very good. That was another, that was before. That was, okay, that was because you like Bulgarian chess players so much. That's why you said Kapalov. Exactly. So Gelfand, who is a suspicious challenger, to say the least, he was the, world, he was the challenger. They tied the match. Then they had the blitz chess or something in an one. OK. Now, currently, there's a tournament going on in Moscow called, anyone? You. Tall Memorial. Named after who? Tall. Tall, right. Now, Tall claimed, him, you know, he was writing about his chess life, he said, I'm a better player now, not now, but I'm a better player in my 40s than I was in my 20s, because I understand chess a lot better now. Of course, his tactical eye may have been a little slower. But he's, un his understanding of strategical ideas was good. Well, I played Boris Gelfand back in the day. You don't remember what day that was, because it was many days ago. Okay, it was thousands of days ago. This game was played in 89 or 90. I don't remember, because it was so long ago. And Gelfand was an up-and-coming player. He was a top player, but not like now. Now he's playing in the Tall Memorial. Gelfand is in second place. Gelfand has two wins and four draws. Solid. Now, I played Boris Gelfand back in the day. And for the strategic ideas class, there's one very important moment. Nimzo Indian. That's not the important part. And like the other players, we developed all of our pieces. We must have been good, too. And we got this position. OK. And it's about equal. Maybe I'd rather have white, but well, I was white, so I guess I'd rather have white. But OK, it's about equal. And here, black made a crazy decision. And in my opinion, I could be wrong. I never asked him, actually. I probably should ask him. In my opinion, he thought, I'm no good. I can't disagree with him. And he's really good, so he's got to mess the game up a little so I can play really badly. He has to give me a chance. This is pretty boring, so it's hard for me to blunder all my pieces. So Galfian was thinking, if I make the game crazy, then Ben Feingold's going to blunder every move and I'll win. Okay, that, I can't really disagree with that. He's right. But he went a little too crazy. And this actually happened today in the US Junior Championship. But it worked. The guy went too crazy. And he's the guy who's in first place. Luke Harmon Velotti, your favorite player, right? Sure. Uh, 14 years old. And he's a freshman at UCLA starting in August. Okay, He showed you guys. Okay, You guys are like, wait, I was a freshman at 13. Okay. No, not in middle school, in college. Okay. And he's in first place of the junior. He's from the great chess state of Idaho. With not a great chess state. But he's 2470, so what do I know? So he's 2470, 14 years old, freshman at UCLA, clear first in the tournament here in the US Junior Championship. Now, he played like a lunatic today and was completely lost. Down three pawns for nothing. Computer said minus eight. And he was playing Sarah Chiang, who's not having a good tournament, lowest rated player. And she thought her opponent had threats he did not have. She defended against the fake threats and allowed real threats and ended up losing. So she wasn't too happy about that. And that was the third game this tournament where Luke was completely losing and won. So that, that's how you win tournaments. Okay. Now, he went a little crazy because he wanted to win. And that's what my opponent did here. What's the craziest move black can play? And this is Boris Gelfand now. 
No, even crazier. <laughs> also, for those children in the audience, resigns is not a move, and draw offer is also not a move. Those are my two most common answers I hear. Uh, when I'm at a chess camp, I'm like, what did White do? Resign, offer to draw. How about, how about castle queen side? Very good. Queen takes c4, like, loses on purpose. So he's not doing that. Castle's queen side. Okay, now let me ask you this question. Did black move these kingside pawns over here? No. Good answer. Did black move his queenside pawns? He moved all of them. So when you castle, like looking at white's king, you would like to have all the pawns in front of your king stationary so your king's safe. His king is not safe because he moved all of his pawns. So now we're going to go get him. And this is a strategical idea that you see an opposite side castling. White castled on the king's side, black castled on the queen's side. So what kind of storms do we see? Pawn storms, unlike the storms here at the St. Louis, which are scarier. Although I think Boris was more scared of my storms. Now, if you were here in 2011, in August, I think August is right, might have been July, then you will know that Boris Gelfand lectured this very chess club. Who was at that lecture? Anyone? You were there? I was not there because I was in China and India, so I couldn't, I didn't do it. Although I did negotiate on behalf of the chess club to get him here. So. And the reason he was here, he didn't fly from Israel to say, I want to give a lecture at the chess club. He has relatives in Minnesota and in St. Louis. So he was visiting his relatives. He's like, hey, I'm in St. Louis. Let's go to the chess club. So Boris has actually lectured here, but I don't think he showed this game. Okay. Also, he probably never remember, doesn't remember playing me. But Okay, so B4, let's go get him. H6. Bishop F4, what's my bishop attacking? D6. Now he made the worst strategical move ever. If you made this move, I'd throw you out of class. Okay, well, not the bigger guys, but the small people I would throw out, because I'm bigger than them. Okay. I'm attacking his d-pawn, and he, what he should do is move away his knight somewhere, maybe e5, maybe f8, and then his rook would defend his pawn. But he played a strategical atrocity, e5, horrible. What would Hikaru say? Not impressed at all. Terrible. Weakening f5, weakening d5. You don't put all your pawns on the third rank so you can move them to the fourth rank and undefend everything. Okay. All these squares that my hand is on here, they're all protected. I can't go to any of them. That's the point of playing the hedgehog. After e5, terrible. Weakening the white squares. Now he plays for mate, I agree. And now he played his last mistake. His first mistake was castling. Second mistake was e5. And now he misplaced all of his rooks. If he wants to put a rook on the G file, it should be this rook. But he played this rook to make sure he would have no control over the center. Make sure, 100%. Okay? This rook is just trapped. Terrible. Okay, so I can't be waiting for him to meet me because then he would be showing you this game. And I would be winning the Tall Memorial. So I played A5, busting open the queen side. He's like, thanks for the free pawn. And I'm like, have another. And he decided not to have another. If he took, I was going to play b5. And you see how my bishop is backing up my pawn. Backed up. I'm going to take. If you take, my knight's coming in. And my rooks are coming in. And this pawn is very iffy. And if you play black here, I'm going to really crush you. Because your game is really, really, really bad. Terrible. And he didn't like any of that. So he played even worse. So after c5, he played g4. Terrible. But he's already losing. My computer said so. And at that time, my computer said nothing because it was 1989. But now my computer's like plus everything. Now my computer is pretty happy. I forked his bishop and queen. He took my bishop's blocking his rook, his other rook. I don't know what that's doing. And instead of taking this pawn, I took this pawn near his king. Now he made a fifth mistake. He traded bishops, which he shouldn't do, and took my pawn on b4. Now, whose king is safer? Why? My king's got everything in front of it. His king's terrible. 
And now I played a tactical motif that wins immediately. Rook a8 check. He's got three legal moves. Probably queen b8's not good. Knight b8 is what he played. King b7 is the obvious move. How does white win a queen here? Winning a queen is good. If you're taking notes, winning a queen is good. And this is a tactical trick, not really a strategical trick. Rook a7, skewering the king and queen, and knight b5. Now, is Boris Gelfand going to see that? Is he going to fall for that? No. So Gelfand played knight b8. And now I was complaining and complaining and complaining how bad his e5 move was. And that's why. And again, king a7, king b7 loses for the same reason. The only other legal move that makes any sense is knight f to d7. He resigned instead. And now I have many ways to win, as the computer will agree. Uh, I was going to play bishop takes e5. He could throw this check in if he wants. That's, he could do that if he wants. Now he has some issues. For example, queen takes bishop. What's the best move for white? R highly recommended. Queen takes d7 bait. That's the best move. And if you move your queen away, because you don't want to lose your queen, like I don't know here, now you can mate several ways. Most people like to sack their queen for some reason. So queen d7 and mate. If you don't like to sack your queen, because that's the kind of person you are, then you can play rook takes knight and then mate this way. So instead of all that horrible stuff happening, and there's other horrible stuff I could have done, but that's what I was planning on doing, uh, he resigned. Hooray. If you don't like allowing rook takes pawn check, because you don't like being checked, then you can play rook takes knight, and then rook takes knight check, if you want to win that way. You can win any way you want. There's so many ways for white to win that he resigned. All right, so remember, don't castle into checkmate unless, yeah, but there's a much funnier answer than that. Unless you're playing me, then, you know, then castle into checkmate. I like to win. Mm -hmm.